extraordinary. You take five gallons of herbicides and mix a gallon of alcohol with it, you got full-fledged, unadulterated, total potential sirene gas. That's all it takes. It's dangerous, okay? I got a problem. What can we do to solve it? I can't pull the weeds. I've been doing that for a long time. I've never used one ounce of herbicides in my life. But I've, I've pulled a million weeds, and they're, they're winning. I've lost. Okay, what can we do, Scott? Thanks, John. No, it's not, you're not done. Just a minute. I'll run this meeting, not you. Well, don't shut me off. I will shut you off. Well, then. I want him to be able to respond. You've been, you've been well over your three minutes. Well, then. And I want Scott to be able to respond to it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, you know, the only thing that I can do is, is, you know, uh, is to have him have a weed management plan submitted. You know, um, if a weed, weed management plan is submitted, then it takes the responsibility of chemical removal off of the table. There is an integrated weed management plan, but whoever writes a weed management plan um, then takes on the responsibilities and duties to control those noxious weeds um, for that area. Now, following his deal, he is right. It is hard, you know, and, and some of these, you know, vapors can carry for quite a ways. So how big of a weed management area do we do, you know, and where do you go from there? And, and you know, do I ask a public citizen to take on, or the private citizen, sorry, to take on the responsibilities for public lands and things like that. That's, that goes up way above and beyond my deal because the, the concerns that he is, you know, his health issues and stuff, I've already kind of worked to deal with the, the BLM to give him a buffer zone, but you still have, you know, the, the mine right there that could potentially drip. You've got Forest Service and you've got other private lands in there. So that's not, that's a lot bigger question than I have any answers for to even begin to address. Um, what do they do in other counties? This isn't unique just to Broadwater. And I guess well, one we could take as an example, um, and then if I remember that too, is Missoula County. I mean, they went through times where, I mean, they had total uproar over use of chemicals and whatnot. But then what they started looking at is how their native ecosystem was losing, and they needed to go back. And so they'd come back more or less and said, okay, here's what we need to do. And basically through weed management plans and looking at, you know, all the different tools in our toolkit and how all of these can be a useful tool. Um, but it's a matter of having land managers willing to you know, sign off on that management plan and say that they are going to do their best using multiple tools to keep the noxious weeds under control. The annual weeds, I mean, we have not, we can't do anything about those unless they're classified as noxious weeds. But that's what I look at is when you have one county that went from being um, very proactive on herbicide usage then almost swing in the other direction totally, and then seeing what the reper repercussions were. Now they've actually come back again and said, you know what, we've all got to come to the table, we've all got to design something that we can work with that's best for our landscape because, I mean, they keep pulling up the pictures from the past that shows um, all the um, arrowhead balsam root and um, all the other native flowers up on the landscape by the M. And that changed, I and mean, all of a sudden it became purple and the ugly gray in the winter time because that was all nappy. They're trying to get that back, and they're working on it. I mean, they're using a lot of different tools, and it's coming there. But it's also taking that people coming to the table and willing to work together to where they can work on this weed management plan. Each person has their spot that they're working on, and they diligently work on their piece of ground. But that's something, I guess, is you know, a thing that we can work on. I mean, other counties, you know, they've got
got these weed management plans. People are at the table working together. Um, well, would you two be willing to sit down with John and see what you could do about a plan so that his help is net risk and yet we control the weeds? Um, you know, we'll look at it and, I, you know, like I say, the one, the, the main one that I've got some kind of plan for is is I do have an agreement with the BLM right now, you know, but then, you know, you got to look at, you know, a lot of environmental issues also, you know, because of the way that it does fall right there, you know. Um, i got to look at a lot of different issues there, and I mean, for time being, I'm not going to change any of the, the issues that we have right now, you know, uh, like the, the mine, for instance, they, I'm sure they have several weed plans submitted because they are a large mining operation. That's a requirement. Um, you know, as long as they, they are fitting the law, you know, by doing an integrated approach, I can't go after them for anything. Same as, you know, you, you got to deal with the Forest Service, which is another federal entity along with the BLM, and then you've got your private landowners. And, you know, as long as as long as everybody's meeting that, there's, my hands are only tied so much. I can come with them and offer them these approaches, but you know how do you how do you hold anybody responsible for spray and say in the iron mask? And if if the wind changes just right, you know them fumes, as he called vapors, could drift down into Indian Creek pretty easily. I mean. So, you know, you you got to be very careful on how you handle that because then you start looking at... Um, we well, start dictating then how people yeah. can utilize things for weed control. And all we can do is help them understand all the different choices mm -hmm. and, you know, how things can work together. But, you know, we can't rely only on biocontrol. We can't rely only on hemp oil. We can't rely only on herbicides in a lot of areas. So, we got to look at what's the balance in, you know, I look at it as you're going to have to use a whole toolbox in order to attack these weeds. And I think that's true, you know. Um, there is more than just one or two landowners. I mean, Correct. there's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now the biggest way that I can, so to say, dictate on the outcome is, is to keep that agreement with him and, and not allow certain herbicides that I know he has said they cause him health issues and try to keep that out. Being surrounded by the BLM, I've got to be very, very carefully careful also because the herbicides that we present to them legally and technically they're not allotted to use. Um, well, the Forest Service and BLM for service and BLM. have a list of chemicals that they've gone through with their EAs that says, yes, you can use it. Mm -hmm. Some of the chemicals, because they've not chosen to you know, go through the expense of a, a new EA and stuff, so they're held to the chemicals that are listed there. They can't just change chemicals as things come on the market. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, their weed managers are telling us, this is our, this is what we can have, and we can't utilize all the extra things that you guys can. So there's, you know, that's some of the things that we have to work within is their boundaries as well. There's a lot of elements, to say the least. It's kind yeah. of like an octopus with lots of legs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, you know. And then, of course, you know, depending on the, the, the weed that you're controlling, you know, certain one of them could violate, you know, label laws too because they aren't labeled for certain, as we all know. Like milestone isn't labeled to control Dalmatian toad flex. So therefore, you've got to add something in that mix to control that Dalmatian toad flax, and yet that, that chemical may not control, say, spotted knapweed. You know, so you know, as far as when it comes to herbicides, you kind of got to try to make the best mix that you can, but also not violate those other laws and EAs and everything else. You know, in an area like that one, it does. It makes it very, very. Uh, very, very tricky, and all I can only do is walk that gray line, so to say, you know, as tightly as I can, and and um, not step over this way or that way, you know, because if I do, you know, then you're putting 
multiple things at risk, I guess you could say. So, um, that's a, it's a honest question. It is a good, you know, good point. But I mean, like I say, short of short of getting everybody together and, and having one person sign off on a weed management plan that says, you know, I'll take responsibility as long as no chemicals are produced here or, you know, used in this area, which there again, that kind of throws, you know, that, that one entity or whoever wants to take control of that into, a, into an area, a risk area too, you know. Um, I do have multiple, I have, like she says, I have been utilizing one tool and that I have been kind of focusing that area into an insectary for biocontrol um, towards the spotted napoles and things and, and I know that the BLM and, and some other people have been starting to address the issues of the, the Dalmatian toad flax in there, that area and starting to put out um, the biocontrol for the toad flax in that area as well. But, Are know, they making any gains this biochemical is a bio, I mean is it? The biocontrol? Bio control, I mean yeah. Uh, you hear about it all the time, you know, but... Uh, right. But they're, <coughs> they're making small steps. I mean, we can see in areas, um, like say Dalmatian, for instance, in some areas that when we had the 2000 fire and they just came up and they were like bushes. The biocontrol that's been released, I mean, it helps reduce the vigor of those plants, but they never leave the system. It's kind of like... Um, the fox and the rabbit, when you think of the population is rabbit population goes up, the fox population goes up. When it drops off, the other one drops off. So you're always going to have this moving target, essentially. So in other words, it never eliminates it. Right. It'll never eliminate. And even in, it, in the home countries where these are found, the weeds are there, but they're not so predominant in the landscape like they are here. So the biocontrol agents, you know, learn to keep, keep them in check. Here because they're not native to our area and we're trying to take them and say, well, okay, you're from the same latitude as us, but you're from over across the ocean. There's still some environmental differences when we place them here. So we still haven't found that balance that they like. So we're always introducing them to different spots. And so they are working to help maybe reduce um, the vigor of the plant, but we still need our other tools, whether it be grazing or herbicides, um, Reseeding, reseeding, things like that that mm -hmm. will add that competition to those plants that you would try to take them down a couple more notches. And then it all, you know, it all depends on too, you know, the kind of plant that you're targeting. Say spotted napkins, weed is a very tough one. They've got very good re results with the biocontrol, but at the same time, you've got to add multiple types of the biocontrol to do it. But then because of a, a substance at the root zones, you know, the roots of the spotted nap weed produce makes it almost, it cannot make it almost impossible to reseed back in there because that act, acts as a ground sterilant. So as long as there's mature plants in that area that are growing, you know, spotted nap weed, why come in and put, you know, dollars into reseeding or doing some of this stuff, you know, if it's only going to sit there and not be able to, you know, propagate, so to say, you know, and, and grow. Um, so that's where, you know, that integrated management system comes in. But um, anytime you wish to go look, that actually the insectary that I've got going out there is is on Mud Springs Road, right? As you could turn off Indian Creek and you cross that, the river there, the creek there, you kind of open up around the old berms and there's that flat area, just on the kind of the Crow Creek, the, that side. If you look to you two years ago when I did that, that was 95% not spotted nap weed in there. I put about 1,600 um, rip boring labels in there. And um, last summer when I did my site inspections and monitoring and stuff, um, that was probably down to about 40% spotted nap weed. And I dug four plants up in of those four plants, all of them had larvae in, them, in the roots and they were working on the, the healthy plants. So 
does do some good in some areas, but like she said, because of the diversity mm. of the county and stuff, I've put, you know, knapweed weevils out here had good success. Let's say Deep Creek, for instance, we've put thousands upon thousands upon thousands up there, and you see very little action being done up there. What do they do in Ravalli County? I mean, that just kind of the capital for that week, it seems like. They have insectaries, and actually, you know, Ravalli County, you know, that's part of where one of the collection sites, you know, um, it, it, there again, I think it's kind of the, the fox and the rabbit, you know, once it kind of comes and goes. You know, that's one thing of, of any kind of insect or animal. They're never going to eat themselves out of house and home. The other thing that we've got to look at, too, is the, the viability of the seed. You know, some of these seeds can lie in the dormant for 25 years and then all of a sudden show up. You know, some, some plants produce 100,000 seeds. Are you ever going to get rid of those seeds out of the soil? You know, so... So you're always going to have some of that. I mean, it looks like, okay, we've got a pretty good control for about three years, and we think, man, this looks great. And then we get either a good flush of moisture or something at the right conditions. And now you got that seed bank that's just kind of been sitting there waiting for those right conditions to hit. And, you know, something triggers, and those tend to emerge. Mm -hmm. So now we're coming back, and you think, well, shoot, you know, what, what didn't work last year? A lot of times you just got to go back and think, well, maybe it was seven years ago I had that really huge Napweed population, I let them go to seed. You know, now I'm dealing with some of the after effects, but some of those seeds got buried a little bit under the soil. And so I'm not dealing with a problem that's been there, but it's just going to be a continual problem. So it's not one that we can treat one year and walk away. I mean, this is going to be a continual process as a land manager. You're never going to be out of the weed control business, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it, it could lay dormant for that many years. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I think we know some more on sweet clover, you know, there won't be anything for years and all of a sudden they have a certain year and that mm -hmm. hillsides are just yellow with sweet clover. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. A spotted napweed so you can lay in the, in the soil for 10 years. It can get stay dormant for 10 years and I think one spotted napweed plant can produce 10,000 seeds. So, you, you know, when you think about that, one plant's allowed to go to seed. That's 10,000 seeds, you know, up to 10,000 seeds that can lie there dormant for 10 years. Now, say a quarter of those pop up and, and make new plants the next year, you know, that's 2,500 plants. Spreading pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Also, some of them, you know, certain biocontrols not out there, you know, for certain plants. Canada thistle. Um, you know, they, they were trying to tell me, show me studies this year, Canada thistle or, or a white top, saying how the, the grazing actually, you know, grazing of certain animals on those plants, concentrated grazing actually is a control method now. But at the same time, it contradicts itself because both of those plants, noxious weeds, are rhizomatous. You know, and they have, exi uh, you know, just huge root systems. Anybody that knows anything about grazing, grazing of rhizominous root system only allows it to propagate more. It is not a true control method. So therefore, you got to, I mean, you can if you, if you, I mean, but you're going to then overgraze, have to overgraze that property so much that, the only food source is that plant, that regrowing plant you're going to have to sit there and boom, 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 because every time that animal takes a, a bite of that plant, that plant's telling itself, okay, well, they're going to sit here and concentrate on this, so they're going to shoot up another plant, shoot up another plant, you know, so. But that can be advantage over time, too. It and can the be. thing is, you're reducing seed production. I mean, that, if that's your goal, you may not, you may be taking a little bit of a hit on the health of the plant, or you may weaken it somewhat. But I mean, your main goal with that is you are basically telling yourself you don't want any seed propagation. 
that the goal is zero seed propagation. So you're going to have to take it off either at bud or before bud stage all the time and then just keep it down. And yeah, I mean, if you have a monoculture that plant, you can work on that. If you have other grasses and other things in that field, you know, they're going to go hit those things and so you can't focus on it. And that's where you have to come back and forth with animals. People don't always want to do that, you know. They don't have the right facilities or capabilities of moving animals in and out every 10 days or every seven days or whatever it takes, you know, to get that plant continually through the summer. I've seen that spot in that we were in an area where it's mowed all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And presumably that stuff's only about that tall and it's seeding out. Yep, mm -hmm. and it's producing flowers. Yeah. It's one that it does, it recognizes that height and it hits that and it says, uh oh, I got grazed off or mowed off at that time. Mm -hmm. Now it stays under that and goes more rise off, yeah. more Spray, lateral yeah. across the ground. It sends up the flowers. Right. So I mean, there's a lot of things. Back to a conversation we were having. No, John, I'm going to have you and Scott take it out in the hall. So we no, 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 no. No, so we can continue you, on with I our business. I want you to hear it. Thank because you. I'm at risk. Now, I think it's only fair that we've, we've gone through this and gone through it, and there's got to be an answer to it somewhere. And I'm willing to do what I can do, but I'm imposed with a problem that comes from you, the county. There's a right-of-way through the property that you use for since 1957 that was abandoned in 1941. December the 1st. This right-of-way was used by the haul trucks from Diamond Hill. John, why don't, when, when you get with Scott, uh, maybe he's aware of this, but, but work with him on that part. Well, he just said the magic words. Uh, it, he can't do no more, and I think he's done all he can do. I will give him that credit because he used the special material. He gave me time. I got up and I left. But then I found out that other people were spraying right on anyway. Okay? He don't have no control on them. But our commission, this is our county, does have control on it. No, we don't, John. You On a county road? We do not have that control that you're speaking We're of. in the Forest Service and, and BLM. We, we have no control with that. But there, we're talking about on the roadway that is the county, going, part of it's going through my property, and part of it that went way around was abandoned by the county, and it is one hell of a mess as far as obnoxious, so call it, the weeds. It's, a, it's like a harbor. Can we get back to the agenda? Yeah, well, maybe, like, say, maybe you, you know, Scott, have you seen that? But, okay, I guess if the two of you have to figure out something. You guys go out in the hall and discuss what we can do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Will you back up what he says? Of course I'll back up with this. Okay. <laughs> I'm just needing some help. I've got a lot of help. Okay. Who else would be good at the wants to talk to us about that he's here in the room. Come on up, Mike. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? Good. How are you? What I'm here for is some help. We need to change how the, they're snow plowing this road. We got a, we have last year we had the problem. Now this year we're starting to plow. <coughs> when they snow plow, they're snow plowing everything right up against the curbs. We're ending up with like a three foot berm at the curb, about a foot tall, a foot and a half tall. And then when it starts to melt, I have no way to remove it. And then when it starts to melt, it all turns to ice, starts to melt, and it turns to ice and it can't drain. So then now we're having issues with people. I had a lot of complaints from the public saying how they're slipping and slipping around, walking over that burn, especially like starting probably tomorrow. Yeah, it's really, the state's the one that's causing it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know why they're not snow plowing towards the center. Most, most of the, oh, usually the only time they do it here that there's any amount of snow and then they do it and haul it out, you know, but yeah. I wonder if, uh, if we or say any other business talk to them, they couldn't just come through the loader and clean that out. That's about the only way they're getting unless they go to the center and they still got loaded and haul it out. Yeah. But maybe they would just come through there uh, and take those uh, berms out of there. I mean, if they, when we have a snow like this, they need a snow plot to the center. Then at least it will melt away from the center, even if they don't get to it until they get to their loader and load it up. It's it's a problem. 
I mean, right now, it's going to happen tomorrow. We're going to rise in temperature. It's going to start to melt, and then it freezes at night. And it's going to turn into, a, and then it stretches about three, four feet out past the berm. And then we have this nothing but ice. I mean, everybody walks through it. Yeah, they, they got to they change how they're doing, so I just need some help figuring out what to do to get them to stop doing what they're doing. I would be glad to put together a letter to the city, uh, and more specifically to Jeff DeMars, who's head of this division here, okay. really, in the region, through the highway department, see what we can come up with. Okay. That's what I would say. Uh, that's all we do is suggest it to them, you know, and they don't do it, follow up with them. It's, it's just a huge problem. I get a lot of people complaining about it. I had points five to seven people today. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, and yeah. the snow keeps coming, so it's going to continue. Yeah, there's a lot of people that come in this courthouse every day. I don't know how many, but I think at least 50 to 100 people a day walk over that road. There's any way we can get rid of it. Even if they just control it from. Main to, yeah, yeah. To like uh, the first five chair or wall, I mean. Yeah. Uh, but um, I've been in a lot of cities, and I've never seen them snowplow out to the edges. I've always seen them snowplow into the center. I've never. Like the only time they do it here is if there's any amount of snow, they do that. Mm -hmm. Then they call it out. But uh, uh, of course, we haven't had that much snow. That I guess that's really I don't know. We've but, had two events last year. One now. Now, if you go out and look, and then we were out there today. And they take and they, sh they go so close and then they'll sh shovel it right, snow plow right back up on the curb, yeah. up on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Debbie Ruckel was walking down and saw, and Jerry were out there when they did that today. <laughs> well, I would be glad to put together a letter and see if we can get some help. I appreciate it. Yeah, we need to do something different. And somebody's going to get hurt. They are. You know, that's an ongoing problem because years ago when I was clerking in Carter, and I won't even admit to how many years ago that's been, <laughs> I remember on Christmas Eve day, I worked and let my staff go. When I went to go out, I was having to climb over the burn. So. Yeah. Well, I'm working right now. I mean, it'll take, it'll take days to get rid of that, or weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it just kind of you know, melt in the day, turn to ice, and then oh, yeah, it doesn't have any water run. Does it run away? It doesn't. There's no, no drainage. So, all right. I'll be glad to put them together. Okay. Appreciate it. I'll give you a copy. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mike. Anything else that's good of the order? Um, just one small little thing. Bring it on. Money. Uh, yeah, our number one job, balancing the budget, budget and managing the county's finances. Um, Franklin uh, got his win on the lawsuit. Of course, all three of us are guilty of violating open meeting laws. Um, I will again reiterate that not a single one of us did anything maliciously. There were errors that we can and should and uh, will be learning from. Um, but now the uh, attorney's fees for Franklin have been awarded. Uh, from Judge Reynolds. So we've got $8,200 from one attorney, probably at least that same amount from the second attorney. Now we're talking $16,400 in county money that could be used on <coughs> any variety of things that are going to lawyers. Um, we can start with those uh, figures. We can move to end this today at noon. It's a continuation of last week's agenda. Or we can carry this on for another month and tack on another guesstimation of ten grand. Now we're looking at twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars that could be done, used on other county needs, operations, services, you name it. So I want to move again that we end this today at twelve noon and go back to doing county business for the citizens and the excuse me, and the good of Broadwater County. Very good. Thank you. Comments, thoughts? Yeah, I already said for one thing, I don't know where she's going with these figures. And uh, it's, as uh, far as I'm clear, it's out of our hands anyway. So, uh, that's Mr. Murphy seconded then. I seconded the motion. What's the motion? That we end this at 12 noon today. End what? The fighting. 
these lawsuits, lawsuits, the back and forth. Let's just end it and get back to county business. We've got so much to do. We've been on county business. Besides that, like I said, there's all these investigations and no more comments from me. They, they had, it has nothing to do with the investigations, but um, we need a unanimous vote to just end this and get back to work. Well, and like I said before, it, it's going to take all three. It can't be one, two, three. It has to be all three. It does. It's moved and seconded then that we end this lawsuit fight as of noon today. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Mr. Franklin, it is a no. For one thing, I don't have any idea what those figures are she's talking about. It's public record. You can look at the claims. <laughs> Anything else? No, that's it, Madam Chairman. Franklin, anything else? No. I move that we adjourn. All right. Thank you. Hope everyone has a very nice Christmas.